Okay, so for this month's Fearless Fridays interview, I'm here with David Payne. I know David from university. Um, and David, if you want to start by introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about the um, career journey so far. Okay, thanks Anna, and thanks for having me on. Um, I feel like uh, I might just be a little bit of a fraud actually coming onto your show about uh, Fearless Fridays. I, obviously I always read and I see all these people making changes to really fun, big lifestyle changes to things they've always been passionate about, being standalone in, in their own businesses or starting something new. Uh, my change has been something I made last year uh, from you know many years in, I guess I started life at McKinsey and then spent uh, many years in, in finance, in hedge funds and investment banks. And last year made the jump to a tech startup. So we were a 10 person company then when I joined uh, and we're 20 now. Uh, it's been a really positive change. I'm really enjoying it. The company's called Rotageek, uh, and we it's a retail technology company. We we make an app that does staff scheduling, so rotors basically for shift workers, mostly in retail and some other kind of related industries. Mm -hmm. And that was a change that I made last year after 10, 12 years in professional services. Okay. Well, I don't think you're a fraud at all, and I think any kind of change requires courage, and many of us never take that leap. So I think you know there's always a bit of mm -hmm. bravery involved, definitely. Um, was there a moment then at which you felt like, right, it's time for a change? Did it happen gradually? What was the sort of process that you went through? So I think probably almost ever since I got into it, I think I had questioned uh, the move into finance, which was back in 2006. I think I never really regretted my two years at McKinsey, um, w which were excellent. But uh, uh, but the, the move into finance after that, I think I wrestled with for a long time and always wondered if it had been the right thing. Uh, and I did a bunch of different jobs within that sector, uh, sort of searching around for things which would suit me you know, better and experimenting with various aspects of it. And you know, the essence of it is that I really liked a lot of what I did in finance. I found it very sort of um, intellectually um, inspiring. I found that I was doing interesting work a lot of the time with interesting people, with good access to you know, top executives and all kinds of fun things like that. Uh, plus, I guess rewards were reasonably good as well. Um, so there were lots of really nice things about working in finance. But all along, really, I questioned whether it was work that needed doing. So I guess, in a sense, my my sort of wrestling was with a quest for impact. Uh, and I guess I fundamentally felt, even when I was enjoying myself doing finance work, that you know it, it didn't really advance um, you know the sort of the wheel of mankind. And really, mm. this was most of what you know. Uh, investment funds and investment banks are doing is really just kind of trading the wealth around between um, yeah, between sort of wealthy clients and institutions. And it doesn't really impact the, the real economy in any major way. And of course, as a professional services person, your direct impact, you know, your ability to have an idea about what a business should be doing instead of just predicting what probably will happen, um, your ability to kind of have any impact on real people and real things is really limited. Mm. Uh, so that's something I'd always kind of struggle with. As I say, I I found lots of things to be happy about, uh, and it was it wasn't just sort of selling my soul, um, <laughs> but it it wasn't it, in some ways it was never enough. Um, and I guess looking back, I question why I left it so long before making any change at all. And you know, along the way, as well as sort of experimenting with different roles within finance, I had experimented with. I guess I thought if I ever jumped ship, it would be into a food business because I have a, a real passion for food, and I had taken a year off to train as a chef in the middle of all of that stuff, and then. Um, just the year before, so 2015, before making the big change, I had experimented with a, a wine pop up um, and, you know, various things in food. That, and I thought that would, if I ever got around to making a big change, either as a sideline or as a completely new career, it would be something like that. Um, and then when I guess sort of deciding it was time for a change, it was funny because I guess after the wine pop up, maybe towards the end of 2015, I had really made my mind up that it was, you know, enough probably was enough and I was mm. going to have to make a move. Uh, and then it was, you know, the early part of last year was quite strange for that in a way, because um, having made my decision that I was probably going to leave investment banking really soon, the investment bank that I worked for effectively collapsed and uh, mm -hmm. I was made redundant from it. I mean, hundreds of us were. Um, and uh, that was a funny thing because I was having effectively made the decision, but then had the decision slightly taken away from me. Mm. Uh, I had a very kind of, I guess, funny sort of psychological reaction where I felt the immediate need to go and get another finance job because it didn't seem right to not have that safety net or not to have made the decision on my own terms, mm. um, which I did sort of do. I interviewed for various jobs and uh, got one. And uh, it was only when I 
turned, you know, effectively having accepted a job, end up phoning them back and saying, I actually, I'm not going to come. Uh, and that was the real decision to, I guess, definitely move. But mm. so there was sort of several, it's a very long winded answer, but there was sort of those several elements and I guess lead ups to finally making a real decision middle of last year. Yeah, well, lots of really interesting and really uh, familiar elements for me too. I think that idea of making an impact, I've read that that is really the number one uh, driver of job satisfaction, feeling that you have a direct impact on the world, on people around you. So I understand that completely. And um, it's interesting as well that you sort of, as you said, when the, that decision was made for you, suddenly, even though it's the decision you're going to make anyway, you sort of think, hang on a second. And um, what do you think was, I mean, you said at the beginning that you weren't so fearless, but what was the challenge that you faced as you were making this de decision? So I think the big challenge I've always had, and the reason I probably spent so long um, in, you know, let's just say broadly professional services before joining a company and, uh, you know, in the end, a, a really small company doing something really different and arguably risky um, was kind of this idea of picking a horse. So I think it was I think it's a, why a lot of people go into things like consultancy and finance in the first place is you get to have, you know, keep your options open, people say, you know, you're kind of you're you're not particularly backing any one business. You're not becoming overly specialist in any one thing. You're just being a sort of smart person who likes solving problems, but those problems change all the time and the clients and which particular horse you're riding changes all the time. Um, and I think that was always, that's always been the challenge and the reason for one of the big reasons for not leaving. Um, and I think I, even after deciding that directionally I should not be in finance, but should be looking at, let's say jobs in the real economy, I still, I still found it quite hard, at least initially to narrow down the field and to sort of decide whether I should be working for a big company or a small company. So I was sort of looking at jobs at other retail things, um, and sort of Amazon, Tesco, those kind of big retail companies, uh, which I guess would, would have themselves already been a big change from, mm. from finance to the real economy and would have ticked some of what I was trying to do. But, you know, would have, I guess it would be still pretty different from what I'm doing now uh, and in some ways more like staying in the corporate world. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so, yeah, so I think sort of, knowing which roles you're going to be suited for, which companies are going to be successful uh, and deciding, I suppose, yeah, ultimately which kind of horse to back. And, you know, when you've got to just pick one thing and be focused on it completely for, you know, years, mm. uh, that's, I find, I, I've always found that difficult. I think lots of people find that difficult. That's probably the big reason people sort of go into these things in the first place and mm. maybe they stay in them too. Yes, me too. And many of us, I think, have a lot of different interests. We're good at different things. So it's difficult to, um, choose one of those things. I like that idea of betting on the one horse. I guess the question then is, how did you get through that? Where did you get the support that you needed to um, to overcome those difficulties and bet on this one horse? Mm. So I think probably there are kind of, I would say there were three things that ultimately made this sort of, let's say, emotionally easy. Um, one was that um, friends were just very supportive and positive. You know, you never quite know. I think it, with despite all these other things I've already said, there is obviously an element of kind of rewards and status that go into trying mm. to pick what your career should be if you're going to define in any way by what your career is. And I think I had a sort of legacy perception um, or maybe just a little bit of one that, um, you know, doing a sort of credible banking kind of job was a, was a respectable thing. But it's, I think in a way, when, when you start to tell people I've, I'm not doing that and I'm looking at this, people are way more excited than this mm. because it has a some kind of like real content that people can really engage with, particularly. Well, maybe if I tell you a bit more about Road to Geek in a minute, but, uh, you know, it's a really interesting problem that we're trying to solve here. And I think people genuinely find it interesting hearing about it. And, you know, I guess there's a sort of funny kind of status or. Uh, at least of kind of just interest value, you know, bringing something something to the party that comes from that. Um, so people are very positive. And I think among my friendship group, I've also got some really good role models mm -hmm. um, of people who've um, been really successful and got just a lot of pleasure out of doing slightly quirkier, more interesting, mm -hmm. small business or new technology kind of things. Um, so that was really helpful. Second thing was that uh, my girlfriend went through a really similar thing at a really similar time. So effectively, we were backing each other up in making mm. the decision. She's made the move from uh, private equity to uh, actually a really, really tiny startup. So it's, uh, it's, it's just doing its initial fundraising right now. Uh, brief plug, it's called Oho, and it's an uh, edible water bottle. It's a sort of uh, um, degradable packaging for uh, biodegradable packaging for initially for water. Oh, sounds um, interesting. 
uh, maybe you should have her on your show. Uh, Absolutely, in, I'll, I'll book her in for <laughs> in next month. month. Yeah. <laughs> um, but they, yeah, so she was, I mean, that's what she's ended up uh, going into. But that whole process of sort of getting out of, um, you know, professional services and finance into just something more interesting. And I guess hers is really changing the world. Mm. Um, uh, so we were there for each other going through that, which mm. was also great. And I guess the third thing, and I don't know if this really belongs in the category of support, but it definitely was the thing that made the decision easy, was stumbling across, and I guess I can't give myself any more credit than saying that's how it happened, stumbling across this specific opportunity. I'm not sure I would have been happy in just any startup. I don't think it was small company or technology that I was looking for narrowly or specifically, or that it was definitely just the right fit for me. But this particular team and this particular problem, I just found really, really compelling. I think it's a really big commercial opportunity and a really fun thing to be working on. And having stumbled across yeah, this, this company and this team uh, seemed like a very easy decision actually in the end. Hmm. Well, that's very interesting because as you said before, your passions were you know, rather in the food industry and then you stumbled upon this so it's difficult I guess for someone to plan that kind of route it's not the most obvious choice maybe which is the best next step for you yeah I mean it's a good yeah you're right it's a good point and I suppose you know I I guess it, it, it's always hard to know how sort of sort of post hoc to mm. try and make the narrative you know food is a big passion for me but it's also I think it's uh, I'm very happy with it being a hobby and just mm. something I I like rather than something I have to kind of make my uh, my career. And yes, having done a couple of experiments in food, there may have been an assumption that that would be the obvious thing for me to try. Um, but, uh, but, you know, there are other things I find interesting too. And I guess the what's particularly what I guess I, I feel I do and we do at Road Geek is, you know, just a very interesting kind of problem solving. Uh, and I know that sounds nerdy and in a way it's not really a sort of lifestyle change, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but you know, it makes me really happy. I find it really interesting. Um, and I'm sort of happy devoting my effort to it. Um, I guess there is a sort of dovetail with my old career as well, because it is retail related. So all the time that I was or almost all the time that I've been in finance and consulting, I was a kind of retail specialist. So that I've been looking at that industry. Uh, but I guess throughout that period, I was looking at it kind of from the outside in. So and as I say, kind of with all the, uh, I guess, sort of impotence that comes from you're just making predictions about what people actually running these companies will do because that's how you beat the market hmm. um, and now you know uh, I guess we're a supplier to retail companies but within our company it's you know we're actually getting to make the decisions that drive where we go and we're having an impact on the performance of our retail customers so I, I've kept within my specialty I guess in a way but just from a very different vantage point. Hmm. Well, I guess you sort of partly answered the question already, but what is the best part of this new lifestyle? Maybe now is the time to give the plug for, for what you guys are doing and why this kind yeah. of problem solving is so interesting. Oh, uh, you're right. And it's, um, yeah, it, and the, it's in some ways it's lifestyle. I mean, I guess it depends how you use the word, but it's, I probably haven't changed my lifestyle very much at all. You know, I still, you know, and I, again, to sort of to compare to some of the people that you've interviewed on this, um, on this blog before who've gone and done, you know, very outdoorsy things or very mm. creative things or move from, you know, from working as part of a team to being completely standalone and, you know, quite big changes in their lifestyle, kind of literally where they are for how many hours a day and this mm -hmm. kind of thing. Mm. In that sense, it's still, I'm still doing an office job um, uh, and I'm still working, I mean, probably harder actually, if anything, mm. than, than before, but I'm much happier doing it because of that sort of feeling of problems we're solving actually matter. Um, you know, my role within this machine is, uh, you know, a bit bigger. I have a bit more um, opportunity to, uh, you know, I guess put myself in the minds of my customers and try and work out what it is we can do for them uh, and immediately impact them and hopefully make life easier for their for the staff working in their shops uh, and that kind of thing. So it's the nature of the problems that we're solving. Uh, scheduling, I guess, you know, it's um, it's quite a I guess it's quite a logic puzzle, you know, it's, there's a lot of it which is kind of like uh, elements of the decisions people make when they're doing these things manually, you know, people make schedules on pencil and paper and they decide to put certain people in for certain days and certain times and then when they're deciding when to let someone take their holiday or they're deciding uh, how you should sort of send this information off to payroll, people make a lot of different decisions, little decisions about how they want to run their shop and how things have to be uh, recorded and all this kind of thing. And you, it sounds like it's going to be easy. And as soon as you get into the detail of what goes into kind of making a good schedule and not sort of using the heuristics that people use to save themselves time when the machine's doing it, you don't have to anymore. 
um, and you can kind of codify all the rules that people implicitly use, but they wouldn't know to tell you that they use. Mm. Uh, it just makes for a really good logic puzzle, um, mm. quite apart from, you know, as I say, the impact we can have on on people working in shops and on the commercial success of our own, of our own mm. enterprise. And you mentioned you're still in the office environment, but do you sense a difference between this kind of more startup-y vibe versus where you were previously? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, yes. So we, I mean, firstly, it's just a completely different mix of skills and people in our team. So, you know, I said we were, you know, we were 10 when I joined and we're 20 now. Most of those people then and now actually are developers. So, you know, these are, we have people with, I guess, sort of deep technical skills um, who are really good at one particular thing, including, you know, not just the guys writing the code, but also data scientists um, and, you know, uh, creative designers look, creating the look and feel of our app. So, the, you know, people with just an interesting mix of skills and from a different set of backgrounds from what I'm used to working with. Um, it's obviously just a much smaller outfit. Um, and so that's an element of, you know, I guess sort of anyone can do anything depending on what needs doing sort of all hands to the pump kind of environment which is a really nice collegiate feel um and it's also i think probably the biggest thing is that we're sort of uh i don't think we put this on the uh, on the investor pitch but there's an element here of we're sort of making it up as we go along no one knows better than us how to do this and no one's ever really done it before um you know there are of course there are sort of digital solutions for scheduling that exist in big companies and in small companies but you know, there are not very many that have taken advantage of the recent revolutions in, you know, mobile technology. So the whole thing is based around an app and you're really taking advantage of to the maximum of uh, the communication that that allows. And that's making use of, I guess, sort of, you know, machine intelligence and really kind of big data processing um, to produce kind of data driven, statistically driven kind of models of, of the future that you're going to schedule to and this kind of thing. So, you know, yes, the, you know, we're not there is competition to what we do, but actually it's it's a pretty new field or a new field that's mm. making use of those things to the maximum. So the things that we kind of invent are genuinely being uh, invented for the first time. And that's an interesting environment. You know, I guess, of course, people are always trying to try new things and move ahead of each other in trading and in making investment decisions in the finance world. You know, every mm. industry has has its innovation, but this feels a bit more a bit more cutting edge and a bit more... Uh, like there's room to try anything. Mm. Well, it sounds exciting. It's also inspirational to see how happy you are about it and passionate about <laughs> it, which is really the end goal for many of us, right? So. That's nice of you to say. Yeah, no, I, I, I genuinely feel really great about the uh, about the transition. And um, yeah, I know it probably probably sounds a bit nerdy to be getting so excited about the jigsaw puzzle of good scheduling. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, that's it. That doesn't matter, does it? It's an individual choice and it's, it's about finding the fit for you. So Yeah. No, it's been a really good move. Mm. And uh, as I say, kind of, you know, I started earlier by saying, you know, I'd questioned for a long time uh, whether it made sense to be in financial services. And, you know, the difficulty had one of the major difficulties had always been picking the horse. Um, and I think it kind of just turns out that, uh, you know, if, if you're presented with something that really excites you as a puzzle and you're really happy to work on, then it sort of makes a lot of sense to to jump with both feet. Mm, fantastic and I want to ask this last question I think in two parts and it would be uh, what advice would you give to someone first of all who's in the situation you were I guess a couple of years ago who's you know questioning is this the industry I want to stay in and so on and and wanting to make a bigger impact how might they go about that yeah uh, so I guess yes you're right there is a sort of two parts there so the the advice about whether or not I guess to make a big change I would say I mean probably it's obvious from or at least my own perspective on that question is probably obvious from some of the things I've said already. But uh, I, th I think maybe the important thing, particularly for people of, let's say, sort of my generation, people who left university in the sort of early to mid 2000s. Um, and, you know, really, I remember that, you know, when we were at university, the careers fair only had, you know, consulting, yes, law and banking exactly. and everything else, including going into um, big corporates like the one that you went into. Mm. Actually, even that was considered an alternative career. Mm. Joining a small company or something with an unproven technology was literally an insane career. Mm -hmm. And I think it was a sort of, you know, cultural, or at least a received wisdom that, you know, th those sorts of things might be exciting and you might make your fortune and it might be brilliant, but probably it wouldn't. Um, and, you know, that trade off was was very clear. And I think in a way that's just been proven wrong. 
Um, and the world sort of changed. It changed quite quickly, I think, after that. And now, as I said already, kind of like, you know, the examples I have among other people of our generation who made that change earlier, generally, you know, even the things that went wrong didn't go very wrong. Um, and everything sorted itself out just fine uh, because you benefit from the experience, even if you don't immediately find the thing that's going to make you happy or that's going to uh, reward you highly straight away. Um, so I think that's probably the main thing, just to sort of to stop, to, to make sure one isn't just embracing that kind of legacy logic, which isn't true anymore, that these kind of professional services are keeping your options open and it's playing it safe. And it's the it's definitely the better half of the trade off. I think that's just sort of the evidence is that that isn't right. Mm -hmm. um, and to, you know, I guess to anybody who is in professional services, who doesn't positively and absolutely love it and mm -hmm. genuinely enjoy being defined by it, uh, there's probably worth looking at other things. There's a lot of interesting stuff going on out there. Um, the how is, I guess, a much, in a way, harder question. And I already said I feel quite lucky. Mm. Uh, I actually had given myself mentally a year uh, to make the transition from banking to something good in the real economy, as I said, be that big company or small company, because I didn't know, you know, I didn't know what I was suited to and I didn't really know what was out there. So I wanted to take a lot of time over that decision. Um, and uh in the end as i say i kind of stumbled across this because i found that my network and i know i don't normally use the word network i sort of think it has a slight you know sort of uh, mercenary feel to it but just you know being being able to reach out to people including people i was not that close to but i knew might know some of the things i wanted answers to uh, and just say can i borrow you for an hour uh, to tell me about things or do you know anyone else i should talk to um and people were very giving and people were really helpful and I think, you know, I guess uh, maybe this is sort of obvious. It didn't feel immediately obvious to me, but it worked out really well was just to kind of to yeah, reach out to all of those people because they, they don't mind being asked and they probably do know or they can certainly get you started. Mm. And I think that is obvious. And as you say, I think networking feels quite icky to most of us. And I think at the end of the day, it's just talking to people and most people are really happy to help. And I found that too, that my broader network, actually people I didn't know so well, have been incredibly supportive and, and inspirational as well. So that's a key part. I guess it, just to pick up on one thing that you said in terms of the world has changed, do you think then that students graduating now are in a different position? Do their career fairs now have exciting startups and, you know, mm. a, a sort of stall for, hey, you can start your own business, you can travel the world, you can sit with your laptop on a beach in Thailand? Do you think it's ah, changed? That's a really good question. I mean, what I don't know is what happens at those career fairs. Mm. I do know that, um, you know, in the investment bank I was in until last year, definitely the sort of the kinds of people that were applying for graduate jobs had changed a lot. And mm. basically people from our university broadly were not applying for graduate jobs at, at my investment bank and probably not at many others. Mm. So I think in that sense, people had moved on and found, you know, those other things to do, or at least a different mix of things to do on leaving university. On what they should do, I guess, in a way, yes, the answer probably is the same. If, you know, if, if these kind of interesting companies like Rotogeek and, and like OHO and, and all these other things are um, you know, just have a bit, there's a bit better sort of uh, early stage investment infrastructure around these things now. It's a bit easier to, you know, the, the mix of people going into them is from much broader range of backgrounds. You know, it's a much easier choice in some ways. So I'm sure lots of them are and should uh, make that kind of transition or, you know, do make that move instead. Mm. I think, I mean, not to go too sort of wacky on your show, but uh, I think there's a part of me that thinks we should all kind of be making career decisions slightly differently now kind of in light of you know the way that the world of work is probably going to evolve quite significantly within our you know what we would have called natural career spans you know the next 30 years um to the point where to some degree you know humans are not going to be doing nearly so much of the work and mm. including lots of what today is considered kind of cerebral and creative work mm. you know sort of machine intelligence is going to take over a very great deal of this and I think in that sense planning a career around wanting to climb 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 for the next 30 Absolutely. years in whatever field you know be that a corporate field or something a bit more um, a bit more creative or a bit smaller or a bit more innovative whatever it may be you know I think all of these things have to be considered in the context of a world of work that probably isn't going to be quite the same shape in terms of seniority progression and retirement that our that our parents was um, I don't know if that leads us more towards uh, you know, corporate work or risky work. But I think it, I think what it does mean is you have to be doing work that you enjoy doing mm. rather than work for a particular purpose. Um, because the sort of the, yeah, the role that kind of remuneration in particular is going to play is going to 
you know, in, in a sense, those equations are not going to look quite like probably some people imagine them and like they mm. played out for our parents. Mm. But that is interesting. I mean, in terms of not to ask you if you regret it, I suppose, but rather if someone is choosing between, let's say, McKinsey and something a bit more wacky. <laughs> I mean, McKinsey and that kind of um, career, at least a few years in consulting, obviously, is an amazing way to invest in your career capital. And I'd never recommend to someone to do something just for their CV. But clearly for you as well, it has then, I think, opened up the doors of the things that you've done later on. So I wonder, you know, is it necessarily the wrong choice to do that? Or is it just that you, you make that choice then, but just make sure that you keep your eyes open and make different choices maybe in a few years time that is quite a good challenge you're right because maybe i've contradicted myself um <laughs> but uh so you're right i suppose i guess there's a lot to be said for so the specific things i guess that i learned in two years at mckinsey i do carry with me and use and I, they're things that i don't know how easily i would have learned in another environment mm -hmm. um so in that sense yes, I'm glad of it and wouldn't change it. Uh, I guess, I guess it's the, it's the, the preparation that it gave me and the experience, you know, I enjoy, I enjoyed it as a two year program as well. It was interesting work at the time and an interesting life at the time. Um, but, uh, I guess, I guess, I guess, yes, you're right that the, the trick is probably just to have your eyes open and not to stick with things, uh, longer than you're learning for. And if you feel like you're learning things which are not really you, not really important, mm. um, then that's the trigger to move. But yeah, you're right. It's, I guess it's hard to, it's particularly in the early stages of your career, maybe it's more difficult to make that trade off between something which is for the sake of something else, you know, preparation or credibility or mm. particular skills um, versus later in life, um, even only a few years later in life when it's clear that you have, you know, life is for living and you've got to be making the right decision for now. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay, yeah, it's not so easy, I guess, but uh, but some great advice <laughs> yeah. there. So thank well, well done, though. Well done for catching me. Well, I just, I'm just curious <laughs> because I've, I've recently discovered and I've explored the idea of impact. And as I said, it's something that's really important to me, too, and I think to all of us. And there's an organization called 80,000 Hours. And, and in fact, I oh, think yeah. there's some Oxford researchers who've um, looked at, you know, what's the way to make the biggest impact. And in fact, they find that the biggest way to do it is to give... I want to say 10% of your income, get a well-paid job, any job, <laughs> and then give 10% of your income to, you know, a really worthy cause instead mm. of, let's say, going to work in a charity or NGO or something where actually you're an unskilled person who's coming in, your impact in the world won't be so big. And I just find that quite interesting because for me, especially with all the career transitions and so on, I'm encouraging people to find more meaningful careers and so on. But I mean, if you're really thinking of the impact that you can have, um, I think there might be more varied options and again thinking in terms of projects okay two years at McKinsey then two you know that might then help you to do the startup or come up with the amazing idea that is going to change the world the edible water bottle whatever might not have come mm. out if you had gone straight out of the university you know so it's just yeah I think it's not as black and white perhaps as I naively thought a few years ago but it's interesting to explore the different paths that you might take yes completely and the charity one is interesting because I guess it depends if you if you were a person who thought that the object of the exercise was to you know, solely to you know change the lives of the people who you want to benefit, mm. and you genuinely thought going and sort of, you know, selling out and then giving the money away was a sort of quicker route. Then maybe I guess that does sort of make sense. But I, I assume that most most in practical terms, a one can never know that, mm. and you know you, you don't know that you're going to be successful at something that you're not really motivated to do apart from anything else. Definitely. Um, and you know, I guess a lot of this is maybe it's maybe it's selfish in the context of uh, otherwise charitable aims, but the idea that um, people would uh, actually want to make a decision, you know, the, the impact that people are searching for is, is for personal impact. They're not actually yeah. just trying to see a better world. They want to have that active role in shaping it, which ultimately relies on them having the right role within it. Yeah, no, that's a good distinction. I think the personal impact, and that is, I think, more linked then to the uh, job satisfaction in the end than the bigger sort of world peace kind of uh, <laughs> ideal mm. behind all of it. Okay, great. So um, without sort of um, going completely off script and uh, going to intellectual <laughs> yeah. discussion on impact yeah, and so on, <laughs> um, <laughs> if we want to read more about um, Roto Geek and, and Oho, if you want to put another plug in for that as well, then um, where, what website or where can we read more about you? Yes. Uh, so, yeah, by all means, Roto Geek, um, it's, it's Rota as in, you know, for scheduling. So R-O-T-A geek dot com. Um, and we're, you know, we're focused on the enterprise space. So we're sort of trying to, uh, get, uh, I guess, make our solution available to big retailers. Uh, but rotogeek.com. Uh, and yes, uh, the uh, the OHO, it's spelled, it's spelled O-O-H-O. And it's the edible water bottle. Googling it probably is better than uh, me giving the website here. Yes. 
Perfect. Well, great. Well, thank you so much for your time, Dave. It was really interesting to hear more about your story. And, Thanks for um, having me on, Anna. Nice to talk to you. And I think you're, yeah, but you're definitely not a forward, so don't worry. I think you fit perfectly <laughs> into <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye.